Hello, my name's Roisin and I'm sick of reading. Hello friends, today I wanted to talk to you about some of my favourite women in fiction. This is by no means an exhaustive list and it is one that I am constantly adding to, as books with complex and well-written women are some of my favourite things to read. I will say that this list is all characters who are adult women for at least a significant chunk of the book or series that they are in. Uh, when I was doing research for this video I found that loads of the lists of the best female characters in fiction have a lot of girls in people like Matilda or Hermione, people who are not adult. As soon as women become sexually mature in fiction they lose any personality at all a lot of the time. I also wanted to note that I have left some of my favourite and the world's favourite characters off of this list. Yes, I love Lizzie Bennet and Jo March, they are some of my favourite characters ever, but I feel like they have had enough of the spotlight shone on them already. They are almost the archetype of the inspiring women in fiction, and I wanted to talk about other ways that you can be impactful and important other than those two. Uh, so maybe it's not entirely fair to call these my favourite women in fiction ever, since I have left off some of my favourites, but they definitely are women that I find hugely impactful and inspiring. If you like this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for more book recommendations and reviews. But without further preamble, let's get into the list. So the first on my list is a Jane Austen character, and that is Emma Woodhouse from Emma. Jane Austen herself said that she thought that this she had written a character that no one but herself could much love. Uh, I think that all of the adaptations that have been done of this book and the amount of love that people have been recently pouring out for the Emma adaptation has proven her wrong. Lots of people can love Emma. But she is very different from a lot of Austen heroines. For one thing, she is independently wealthy. She's an heiress to her father's fortune and does not have to marry in order to be secure, unlike people like Lizzie Bennet or Fanny in Mansfield Park who do need a, a wedding in order to be safe. Uh, Emma is fine as she is and that makes her one of the richest and most powerful people in her small town where she lives, um, which has a big impact on her character. She is just as bright and witty and clever as Lizzie or Marianne from Sense and Sensibility, but unlike Lizzie she is not entirely self-aware and that is where a lot of the joy of the novel comes from and a lot of our identification with this character. She is the cleverest and richest woman in her village and she never wants to leave. She really enjoys being a big fish in a small town. We see inside her head of how highly she thinks of herself and her plans for the world. She has an idea of how she wants the world to go and thinks just by willing it to be so it will be. She thinks she is so clever to have thought of these things such as trying to get Elton to marry Harriet, but as we know those plans don't always come to fruition. Whilst all of Austen's books seem to be about realising the ways in which you have been wrong, Emma is the character who is brought most low by her actions. We see her fall and we see her ego be bruised because she thought she was doing the best thing and she was acting in the best way, but she hadn't really considered the feelings of other people. Learning that you were wrong, and not only wrong, but that you were doing actively harmful things to other people, can be one of the most bruising experiences, and we feel for Emma when she goes through that. We have all had an experience where the way that we are and our self-perception did not line up, and that is what the novel Emma is about. But the thing that makes Emma truly lovable is that she does learn from her mistakes. While she's confident and determined and thinks she knows best, when that is proved not to be true, she really can change. When Emma's carefully laid plans come crashing down around her ears, she allows her eyes to be opened. Emma is so lovable because she is bright and bubbly and kind, but she is also so ridiculous and silly, and we can see her mistakes. We learn to love a heroine who is highly flawed and also learns to realise that about herself. The next character on my list is Ifemelu from Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Americana is the story of Ifemelu and Obinze, but Ifemelu is really the protagonist of the novel. It is her character journey and change that drives forward the narrative. She grows up in Nigeria and falls in love with Obinze and chooses to follow his path to the USA. But in the end she is the only one who gets a visa. And we see her life in Nigeria and then in the USA and then when she decides to come back to Nigeria, as well as seeing Obinze's life in London. 
Ifemelu writes a blog called Race Teenth, which is about her experience of race in America as a non-American black person. Her blog posts intersperse their narrative with commentary about race in America and about ha- colorism, hair, racialization, and the difference between immigrated black people and people black people who have lived in America for hundreds of years. She is sharply observant and very funny. One of the things that draws me most to Ifemelu as a character is her sense of humor. Um, she is a woman who notices everything. The confidence of the white people, the entitlement she notices in, for example, the father of the child she babysits, who is described as brimming with his awareness of his own charm. Like many of the women on this list, Ifemelu can be difficult. She's outspoken and stubborn in a way that some people do not relate to. She also cheats on her partner for no good reason. He is not a terrible person, she just cheats on him. And Adiche says that this is one of the characters she's got the most pushback for because of that cheating. But she doesn't feel like if she'd written a male character who cheated, she would have got the same amount of pushback. While obviously cheating is not the morally right thing to do, I feel like a lot of people are very stringent on cheating in fiction. Um, They don't allow characters to develop away from that. uh, And they think it's like, they will forgive a murderer before they will forgive a cheater, uh, even a fictional cheater, which I find really odd. If Amelo tries when she first goes to America to fit in with the culture there, she affects an American accent and relaxes her hair. But then she changes back. She realises that she doesn't want to fit in and it isn't worth it to try that way. She gets her Nigerian accent back and allows her hair to be in its natural state. And one of the things that I love about Ifemelu is that she isn't obsessed with being liked. A lot of the characters in the novel, particularly the white women characters, are really want to be liked by everyone and Ifemelu does not care about that and I think that's something that really important that we can learn from that character is how to not be obsessed with being liked. Number three on my list is Amy March from Little Women. I love Jo March as I mentioned already and I grew up with these books identifying with Jo March. She's the protagonist and she's the self-insert of the author because it's a semi-autobiographical novel. I know a lot of people have hated Amy March in the past, but I also know that a lot of people have come to appreciate Amy, especially after the new Greta Gerwig adaptation. Uh, There are lots of videos in defence of Amy March and I'll put one of them in the cards so you can check that out if you would like to. Amy is a child in the first half of the book, but she does grow up into adulthood, which is why I felt comfortable including her in this novel. Now, a lot of the re- one of the reasons that a lot of people hate her is because she because she burns Joe's manuscript um, in a fit of pique. But the thing is that people don't seem to allow is that she is a small child who has been bullied and ignored by her older sister, who constantly makes it obvious that she doesn't want her there. She looks up to Joe. Yes, Amy is spirited and willful, and burning the manuscript wasn't the right thing to do. But we seem to forget that Joe insulted her just before she left, dismisses her feelings and calls her a baby. She's a child and Joe is the one who should have known better. Now, after that apology, (laughs) the thing that I think is so key to understanding Amy's character is that she is the practical March sister. Mommy and their father has have instilled a almost romantic sensibility in the other sisters. They see the world in a far more romantic light than Amy does. Meg, romantic in sense of falling in love, Joe with a romantic notion of the starving artist's garret, and even Beth with kind of a romantic notion of death. Amy is not like that. Even as a child, she is not blind to the ways of the world. She knows what she wants and what is necessary for her to achieve. Some people think she is shallow because she knows she wants to marry rich from a young age. But as her Aunt March says, as Meg didn't marry well and Joe won't marry Marry well and Beth can't marry well. Amy is the sole hope for this family later in life when her parents are too old and need support. When her sisters who won't have a way of supporting themselves, she knows that she is the one who is going to have to financially support this family and that for a woman of that time, marriage was the financial tr- transaction, the contract through which she could do that. I mean, luckily she married Laurie who would have always looked after her family anyway, but she is entirely a practical woman as well as these motivations to look after her family. Amy is fiery and artistic, just like Jo. She is the other side of the coin in some way, but she is too practical to romanticise the artist's life the way her sister does, and in fact too practical to really pursue her own dream. She's also bright and lively and pretty, and I think a lot of people don't like her because of that. It seems to some that she has a life that is easier than her other sisters. And of course, she does have a life that is easier than Beth. They all have a life that is easier than Beth. But her two eldest sisters make a decision for their life to be the way that it is. They decide how easy or how difficult their life will be. Amy is good and kind to Aunt March and she does the job well. Jo is the one who is stroppy and petulant and refuses to engage with Aunt March and yet she feels like she deserved the trip that Amy got. But Amy is the one who did the work to get there. Amy and Jo, as I have said, are very much alike. Both have tempers, both are 
bright and artistic and have dreams and pride. But Joe is too proud to work within the system in which she lives, whereas Amy is the one who knows how to get what she needs. Number four is Medea from Medea by Euripides. Now, Medea is a villain, yes. She <laughs> murders her children and her husband's new wife. Um, he's not really her ex-husband. They never got divorced. He just kind of abandoned her. It's a whole thing. Obviously, I don't condone murder, but I don't think you have to think a character is a good person in order to understand the impact and the importance of said character. Some people say, though, she killed her sons not because she was mad or anything, but because if she hadn't done so, the townspeople would have tortured and then murdered them because she had killed the town's princess. Ancient Greece was a really lovely place to live. Lots of adaptations make Medea mad by the end of the play, but I don't think she's mad. She is completely in control. This is a play about power, how women find power in a world where men have complete control. In classical Athens, women weren't even allowed to speak outside of the home. So this powerful, rage-filled woman is an incredible thing to have in fiction from the time. Perhaps she's given more leeway because she's the granddaughter of the god Helios and female gods are allowed to do kind of whatever they like. She has two great mod monologues in this play. The second is when she weighs up whether or not to kill her children, but in the first she valorises motherhood in a way that heroism in men is, was valorised in ancient Greece. She gives in this monologue a plea to understand the life, the condition of a woman in a loveless marriage and the difficulty that she is going through. She makes herself a valorous hero and ignores her previous crimes in the way that male heroes in classical Greece do continually throughout the epic poems and the plays. They ignore the terrible things that they have done and they allow, are allowed to be heroes through this. Medea is not a great character because you want to be her. She's a great character because the power of her words stick with you and the terrible things that she does, although you don't condone or understand them, you can see how the world in which she lived brought her to that end. Number five is Bridget Jones from Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen Fielding. Oh, Bridget. Bridget is entirely like unlike the other characters that I've talked about so far in that she is kind of not in control. Um, she is a bit of a disaster. If you've only seen the films, I do recommend reading the book. And if you've avoided the films because you're being a bit of a snob, then I would definitely recommend film one and film three. Film two, I don't personally like, but that doesn't mean that you won't. Bridget actually came top in a poll of the UK's favourite women in fiction. And I think that's because so many women can identify with her. One of the great things about Bridget is that she's based on Lizzie Bennet, who is almost this pinnacle of literary womanhood um, in a lot of ways. People really admire her because she says what she thinks and she um, is graceful at the same time, always seems to know what to say, and she also really stands up for herself. Bridget never knows what to say. <laughs> Bridget is always making a tit of herself when she speaks. She is not a perfect person by any means, but one of the things that is so endearing about her is that she's always trying to do her best and always trying to do better. Although I don't like the overt diet culture that runs through the books and the films. Her ability to be vulnerable is something that I think is really ad admirable. She may often be making a tit of herself, but at least she's putting herself out there. She doesn't hide behind anything. She is, she is a kind and really brave character, even though she might be a little bit clueless. She's also really funny in her own right. We're not always just laughing at her ineptitude, but we're laughing with her. And she makes her mistakes not just through ineptitude, but also through being an outgoing, excitable and people-pleasing character she's easily led into temptation and we all have experience with that and she's also i think one of the earliest characters one of the earliest female characters who was allowed to be goofy and to not have it all together she's not the sitcom mum who's coming in to ruin the silly fun of the boys or the rigid high-powered woman who needs to be unwound by a lovable man child it's actually her and her goofy silly vulnerability that opens up the tightly wound and insecure mr darcy number six on my list is angelica from the mermaid and mrs hancock by imogen hermes gower if you've watched most of my book recommendations before you'll have heard me talk about this book and how much i love it and angelica is one of the main reasons for this she is very different from a lot of the characters on this list although like some i have mentioned before her humor was one of the things that really drew me to her angelica is a courtesan in the 18th century london she is 
in a lot of ways, a vain and silly creature. And she also manages to be both aware of the ways of the world and incredibly naive to them at the same time. I think depending on what she wants to be true. She is bright and bubbling character and the action of the book perks up any time she enters the room. But she is a sex worker who has an unfortunate habit of falling for her clients and being willfully naive and having a sort of romantic belief in their goodness and to always be having fun. For a book about performance, an art at which Angelica is shown to be so adept, she's also a tender-hearted and remarkably guileless woman. Gower writes her with so much affection that it is impossible not to like her. Despite her being a female character that many would look down upon for being both a sex worker and vain and perhaps even superficial. But the key thing about Angelica is that she truly understands people and what they want. Her insight is vital to get her through the world. Much of her frivolity is a gossamer illusion, a frilly piece of nonsense thrown over her life in which it is always better to be jolly than sad. We see the vanity, the superficiality, the bright and bubbly pretty character that we are drawn to and then you also see underneath that, underneath the performance and pretense, that that frivolity is an armour against the hardship that she has had to live through. Number seven on my list is Lucy Honeychurch from A Room With A View by E.M. Forster. Lucy Honeychurch is a restless character. We first meet her when she has travelled to Italy with her prim older cousin Charlotte, but she is desperate to see the world. In the beginning, we only see the passion that is stored within her when she plays the piano, and the vicar she meets in Italy says he would love to see what would happen if that passion spread out from her and into her life. Over the course of the novel, she breaks free from the Kent Garden that was planned for her and embraces the passion for life that she was introduced to by the wild nature of Italy. She is a quiet girl and seems almost uncertain at first, but we grow to love her as she breaks free from the life she was expected to have and starts to find her own footing. Her passion cannot be contained and she will not have her life told to her by her mother or her fiancé Cyril. She fights against the rigidities of a woman's place in Edwardian society. And while she may not be as feisty or as proud as a Jo March or an Elizabeth Bennet, she has a passion, a determination and a spirit all her own. Number eight on my list is Miss Honey from Matilda by Roald Dahl. I know Matilda is a great female character, but as I mentioned, I'm not talking about children in this list. I wanted, I wanted to focus on the adult in this book, Miss Honey. She is not to be underestimated. Like in all works of Roald Dahl, there is a darkness here, some of it directly on the page and some of it left for us to infer. Miss Honey is an orphan who suffered abuse at the hand of her aunt, Miss Trunchable, who is still her boss. She is stuck working under her and has been disinherited by her aunt's cruelty. Yet Miss Honey is still manages to be as sweet as her name and to extend kindness to all of the children in her class. She offers them a bright world of sanctuary in the scary place that is Miss Trunchable's school. And she is the one who notices that Matilda is a little girl a lot like she was. She is bright and precocious, determined and brave, despite all the neglect she experiences at home and the terror that Miss Trunchable puts her through. Miss Honey sees that and offers her a way out. It would be easier for Miss Honey to be too afraid of her aunt to do anything about it, but in her quiet, gentle way, she is just as brave as Matilda. I think we could all be a bit more like Miss Honey, whose courage comes from her kindness, who knows the limitations and difficulties of her world, but strives to do all that she can for those in her charge. And finally, number nine is Margaret Hale from North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. Margaret Hale is another quiet but determined character. She may not have Elizabeth Bennet's sparkling wit and may seem on the surface to be a more pious Jane Eyre style character, but the true strength of Margaret Hale comes from her beliefs and her convictions. When she moves to Milton in the north, she knows nothing of manufacturing, having come from an agricultural place in the south of England, and she is naive as to the workings of that world. But she has an open heart, and despite the grimness of the town in which she, to which she has moved, she befriends some of the mill workers in the area. And when she learns of their condition, she becomes their most passionate defender. She may seem like the dutiful Victorian daughter, caring for her parents and her brother, but she is also incredibly brave. She is unafraid to stand up to John Thornton, the man from whom they rent their house, and on whom her father depends for a portion of his income. Margaret's convictions, her sense of right and wrong, leads her to speak truth to power. She is unafraid to learn and discover where she has been wrong or ignorant. She is not proud in that way. Although she does not chafe against the gendered society in which she lives like Jo March does and is perhaps a little too self-sacrificing, her sense of justice leads her to stand up to not only the powerful capitalists in the town but also to the law when she feels like justice is not forthcoming. Margaret's determination and courage may seem at odds with her quiet and caring nature but it all comes from a deeply felt understanding of love and community. There you have it, nine inspiring women from literature. Hopefully they are all different enough from one another that 
I've given you a good range and inspired you to pick up some of these books. I know this list isn't very diverse, a problem of my own limited reading, and while I've been trying to change that over the past few years, two years of actively thinking about diversity in reading as opposed to the years when I was just reading what was recommended to me has meant that my backlog of knowledge is not as diverse as I would like it to be. Please let me know about some of your favourite women from fiction in the comments down below and if you have any recommendations for more diverse books with strong inspiring adult women in them please let me know that too. I would love to read them. Thank you for watching and please give this video a thumbs up if you like it and remember to subscribe because I will be back the day after tomorrow. Bye bye! Thank you.